So welcome back to the summit. In this session, we're going to be talking with Robin Mello of the Philadelphia Orchard Project. I met Robin several years ago when she and I were both taking an advanced permaculture design course. And while I was there, I learned about the Philadelphia Orchard Project that she works with. And it was really interesting. Just I could see so much permaculture that permeated what she was doing. So my first question for Robin is this. How do you work with people, the land, and with food? And how do you do that all together? I think depending on the community, we talk sometimes talk about permaculture and sometimes we don't. And um, you know, the way that we really engage with people throughout Philadelphia is through the idea of taking control of uh, more land, um, having more green spaces, talking to people about growing their own food, um, having more fruit accessible, because uh, we mostly work with fruits and with perennial plants. Um, and that's a pretty, it's, it was a pretty wide open niche uh, for the Philadelphia Orchard Project to enter into because there's a lot of urban agriculture in Philly, but most of it's annual vegetable production. So um, at this point, we ha are able to engage with uh, organizations and neighbors in uh, across 57 different sites all over the city. That's incredible. So you're working with schools too? Yeah. How does that work? Um, we work with elementary schools, middle schools, high schools. Um, we have a couple of university partnerships and um, we, I also have done a lot of work with um, field trips for other various educational nonprofits and um, homeschool, done a, a lot of um, field trips with homeschooling groups in various places. So it works um, really, whatever our partner, whatever a school partner wants or whatever our partner organization that's hosting a field trip wants, um, I will just design something around that. Um, working with kids is usually really easy because they kind of just guide you. Um, a, a, it's yeah. a lot easier not to develop a, a lesson plan a lot of times. Um, I, I have the freedom in doing that, you know, because the, the space offers the lessons. Yeah, but yeah. Are, are you bringing them to the already established orchard projects or are you also establishing projects on site at some, some of the schools? So we have, I believe, 10 school partners, and those are uh, schools where we have community orchards planted. Um, so uh, we actually were just able to hire a, an education director um, for the beginning of 2017, and one of her focuses, her, her main focuses, is working on building orchard curriculum specifically for our school partners. Uh, we received a little bit of funding for that this year. So... Uh, that's something. Her name is Alyssa Schimmel. Um, that's one of the things that she's uh, working on. And a lot of time, that gives me a lot more freedom to be able to do the more on-the-fly things um, at other orchard spaces when a school group comes in or, um, you know, something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well tell, tell, me, tell, tell me a few stories. Just how is this impacting a lot of the, um, the students or the young people who show up on these projects or on these field sure. trips or on the site, you know, what, what yeah. kind of sparks their interest that, that you follow? Yeah. Uh, one thing that come that uh, comes to mind really quickly was a time where I was actually at one of our uh, orchards that's at an arboretum. It's at Albury Arboretum in uh, Northwest Philadelphia. Um, I was teaching a field trip there and we did some cider pressing and then we also did some apple taste testing. Um, did a, a ton of, of le just the whole lesson was about apples, but um, through various different lenses. And what when we did the taste testing, um, the apple that came from the tree in the orchard was the apple that all the kids thought tasted the best. And I didn't have to, you know, I didn't have to do any convincing. <laughs> I, I cut up a bunch of different apples. One was organic. One was, you know, from a conventional grocery store. One was clearly kind of older than the others, you know, just had been sitting around longer probably. And then we picked the one from the tree and um, none of them knew which was which. I tried to do it all, you know, all random. 
Um, Secretively, and, yeah. Yeah, so the kids like that the most. And it was a variety that we plant often called the Liberty Apple because uh, it's a, a fairly new cultivar uh, that's pest and disease resistant. Um, and the kids loved it. It's, you know, kind of tart, kind of sweet, and they had never experienced that before. They just know Granny Smith's and they know Red Delicious. Right. So that was pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. You have any, any questions you have there, Bill? Well, I think my first question is, um, besides the schools that you're working with, are you working with other community groups in the city and putting in um, orchards possibly in empty lots or um, churchyards, that kind of thing? Yeah, we work with any organization that has long-term legal access or ownership of the space uh, I would say, well, we have 57 orchards. Um, the, the majority of them are not schools. Um, I primarily work with adults um, all the time or multi-generational groups. Um, we have orchards uh, at historic houses, which are on parkland. We have orchards uh, in other parklands. We have orchards in community gardens and uh, urban farms. We work with other uh, nonprofit organizations, community development corporations, um, Arboretum, uh, Arboreta, um, churches. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, we have a new partnership with a with a faith based uh, Jewish organization. A couple, actually, two of our newer ones. Um, so we'll really work with anybody who's interested in stewarding the spaces. Uh, once we do the planting. The, uh, the Philadelphia Orchard Project is a supporting organization. So we do a lot of help through the, you know, we do a lot of the design work. We do a lot of the organizing work at the beginning and we help to organize work days and um, planting and harvest days if necessary. But a large part of what I do is also training, just um, ensuring that these people who come to us and apply to have pop partner orchards um, will have the capacity to care for those spaces uh, after after they're planted. Oh yeah, that's a big part. Yeah. So the question that comes there is a vision for Pop when it first started to uh, support the. Well, I mean, actually, well, you tell me what was the vision and how long has the has Pop been there and is that vision unfolding or being fulfilled as it was as it was envisioned? Sure. Yeah. Uh, so the. Philadelphia Orchard Project was founded in 2007, so this is our 10th anniversary year. Nice. Um, I uh, didn't become involved until 2010, uh, and I, I was a volunteer, um, I guess, for four or five years before I got the job. Um, so as far as the very beginning, um, I don't have a huge amount of insight, but I'm pretty sure that the vision has always been to have food forest type, uh, you know, orchards planted as, as much as possible in the food forest type design style um, everywhere in the city that people want them. And uh, we've said a bunch of times, <clears throat> we don't have it, you know, published anywhere because it's a really very ambitious goal. But there have been several times where we have said like, you know, why not have an orchard on every block? Mm -hmm. um, you know, an orchard in every neighborhood. Here. Here. We're pretty close. Um, yeah. to, to having an orchard in every neighborhood, I would say. We're, we're very close. Um, and that vision, you know, is, is most definitely becoming reality in a lot of ways. Yeah. You mentioned the word food forest. Can you describe that? And maybe that's a little bit different than an orchard? Sure. Okay. Yeah. So the word orchard is something that's more uh, digestible. It's easily digestible to, a, you know, your common person, um, to anyone. Um, a lot of times people aren't even really sure what an orchard is when you ask them. Um, so we usually use that as the entry point and then we um, dive a little bit deeper into our planting style, um, you know, after the fact. So food forests um, are spaces that are designed not just like your traditional orchard where you have a bunch of rows of fruit trees, often just one species of fruit tree. Um, but the, the food forest, the way that we plant them is... Um, mimicking um, an actual forest with several uh, layers of plants. Um, sometimes we're able to put in a canopy layer, which would be your tallest trees. Uh, in an urban environment, a lot of times we don't have the space for that. So we have semi-dwarf fruit trees that kind of act as our canopy in a lot of spaces. Um, and then we also have um, 
a shrub layer and we have um, climbing vines, kiwi berries and grapes and we do lots of herbaceous perennials and woody perennials and um, ground covers um, and even uh, incorporating edible mushrooms into a lot of our spaces. Um, we try to have those spaces be as biodiverse as possible. Um, I, I think our list of species that we're working with at this point is up around 200. It might have even surpassed that. Nice, nice. Um, yeah. And, you know, that doesn't mean that we have 200 species in every space, but it does mean that we are working with that many different species. Um, and, you know, just in my garden right next to my house, um, I probably have upwards of that many species, and it's not a very big space. Right. <laughs> um, so, you know, what we, what we do is... Yeah really just try to pack it in and we try to um we I do a ton of my learning just through observation um and and that's what we encourage a lot of our other our partners to do as well is you know some of these things are going to work and some of them are not um some of our older orchard spaces we had to learn some lessons you know early on that we're now you know able to incorporate into some of our newer spaces um but yeah, as, as much as possible, we, we plant really very biodiverse spaces um, and very intensively planted uh, that mimic a, a forest ecosystem. Yeah. Uh, have, have you been able to, um, I mean, do you follow up with most of your projects uh, on an ongoing basis or an occasional basis or, um, you know, what once you get an orchard or a food forest established, uh, you know, what is, what's the next steps beyond that? Once you get people trained, uh, you get it planted, uh, what's your involvement after that point? Sure. Uh, we do a ton of ongoing involvement. Um, there, we have a couple of listservs. Um, we have an orchard group listserv where we can engage with at least one uh, member from every partner orchard. Often multiple staff are, on, you know, are a part of that listserv. Um, we have a website with a, a blog that has a lot of educational content on it. We um, engage with people through social media with a lot of various, you know, educational tips and photos of how to identify things. Um, and then in, in terms of, you know, in-person communication, uh, anytime an orchard partner needs something from one of the Orchard Project staff people, we do our best to go out for site visits and to organize work days, whether that be during the week or on the weekends. Um, we, uh, our staff members have, you know, kind of split up the city a little bit. So I work with, you know, about a third to maybe 40% of our orchard partners. And my boss, Phil Forsyth, uh, works with probably, you know, 50 to 60%. Um, and then we have a couple, um, our new staff people, we're like slowly, slowly incorporating them into, um, taking on more leadership roles. Um, but uh, one of the great things about the position is that at this point, um, I know so many of our partners so well that really, I, I really feel like we are a community. Many of them are some of my closest friends. They're people, you know, yeah. that I have potlucks yeah. with um, right. on a regular basis or that I can just call or text or, you know, go out with at any point. Um, the The urban agriculture community in Philadelphia is um is like ever expanding but it's also a very inclusive community um and i am able to you know i'm really happy to say that i get to work with a ton of my friends you know at any given nice moment. that's the, yeah. <laughs> that's the that's the job perk well Bill, it looks like you've got a picture up here did you want to yeah i wanted to ask you robin about this photograph here it looks like a beautiful cherry tree or a crab apple i can't tell um, but it looks like it's really established. You did just plant that there. So what is what are these folks doing around the tree here? Yeah, so that is actually a magnolia tree um, in, in full bloom. And that was a, a tree that was already in that space. Um, and the volunteers in that photo are planting a pollinator garden um, around the base of that tree. So what you're seeing in the rest of the photo around it um, you probably can't even really see very many trees, but you can see little uh, fences. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that's, a, that's a brand new... Food forest. <laughs> uh, food, or it's a brand new orchard um, on the side of a hill at one of our partner sites called Bartram's Garden, which is one of the oldest historic gardens in the, in the country um, in southwest Philadelphia. So that most of that hillside is uh, grass or clover or, you know, various weeds um but the 
the whole hillside is planted as an orchard with many historic cultivars that the original owner, John Bartram, uh, had in the space and, and lots of other things that are native fruit trees or things that are able to, you know, push the edges of our climate through climate change. And, um, you know, it's a big demonstration site but we wanted to have the pollinator garden on site um, as well because it's not planted in, in the food forest style per se. Okay, and uh, does that mean you have bees established in the immediate area too? Um, I believe there are, I believe there are beehives on site there. There's also a large urban farm um, at Bartram's Garden, really, really wonderful program there. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not sure if there are beehives on site there. Um, but there are a ton of beekeepers in the city. <laughs> um, yeah, very, they'll find very, it. Um, orchards of ours do have uh, hives on site, but I also think that in general, at this point, pollinators are, are not a problem for us in the city. You know, a lack of pollinators, rather. Right. Yeah. So, Robin, you've shared a lot with us um, about how, how your projects are unfolding and um, the different types of uh, locations that you've had them. I'm just wondering if, um, you know, if, if I were a, a new city and I wanted to start an orchard project, what would be some of the challenges or even the fails that I might need to be looking out for? Sure. Um, I think that 100% the most important thing to do at the beginning of trying to start anything is to make sure that there aren't already other people that are trying to do the same thing. Um, or that there aren't already people that are doing a lot of the work that you wanna do that you couldn't collaborate with. Um, one of the biggest mistakes that I see in the kind of work that I do and that others do in the city is a bunch of people trying to duplicate efforts um, and you know, potentially acting as competitors rather than collaborators. And the reason that the Philadelphia Orchard Project is so successful, I think, number one hands down reason that we are able to do what we do with limited staff, limited, you know, budget, limited capacity in general is, is our partnerships is that in, in so many ways, um, pop partners, not just with our community orchard partners, but with, with tons of groups all over the city. Um, and, and that is our main, that's like such, such capital, you know, it's such, mm -hmm. such capital for us. Um, so, you know, I, I think that that's a huge thing and that dives into, um, even deeper issues, which, uh, I, which a lot of people are, are dealing with all the time in the city and that's, don't try to enter into a neighborhood that you don't know anything about. Right. Uh, so you know, make sure yeah. you're working, um, you know, that you learn the the lay of the land before you just jump in um that yeah. i think is one of the greatest failures that i see or one of the greatest maybe faux pas uh that i see in mm -hmm. in a lot of cases is people that are not don't understand or are not willing to you know do the door knocking and do the the handshaking and, and, and find out what's what's going on what's already and, happening and yeah what's already happening and and learn the yeah. history of of the spaces you know that i mean if, I, probably most large cities in, in the country um, could say this to a certain extent, but Philadelphia has an incredibly deep, rich history, but also, you know, has a lot of darkness in it. And we all need to know what has happened before in order to be able to move forward into a future that's better for everybody. Um, so, you know, there's tons, there's huge racial tensions in Philadelphia. There's lots of various um, social inequalities, economic inequalities, um, you know, histories, every block has a different history than the next block. Um, and that is incredible. Um, that's, you know, something that I think is fascinating, but it also makes the work a lot harder. And you need to be willing to sometimes realize that that hard work is more important than growing the food sometimes, because if people don't trust you, um, or if people aren't really interested in what you're doing, or um, if maybe they're even, you know, opposed to you, you're, you're not going to succeed and you're going to, um, you know, any kind of mission that is geared towards empowerment or food justice or food sovereignty is, is never going to work if you don't have people that are working mm -hmm. with you. 
Sure. Yeah. I'd like to ask the question then, Robin, of a little bit about the um, community itself and where a lot of the orchards are going in. And um, one of the things that often, uh, well, that's happening all over the country is it's hard for people to find real healthy food. Mm -hmm. And that um, you mentioned the favorite apple and, you know, the children automatically went to the apple grown in the orchard. Mm -hmm. um, I, I want to pull up another picture here and ask you to tell me um, a little bit about uh, the varieties of fruit that are here. And um, if you feel that the, uh, the access to these foods by people that living in that community, if you think it helps their overall health. Sure. Um, so first, I guess the, the things that are in this photo, uh, this is a photo of one morning's berry harvest, uh, probably right around now, uh, several years ago, probably the first week of June or something like that. Um, in which uh, red raspberries and golden raspberries and mulberries and gumi berries and nanking cherries, um, looks like uh, gooseberries and probably currants, bottom maybe. left black currants or, or black just currants. berries. Yeah. yeah. Um, and that is from, from one space, not a very big space uh, in West Philadelphia. Um, and, you know, we have tons of photos like this over the years of, of you know, ridiculous abundance. And um, I think that oh, in terms of uh, improving overall health of communities, um, I think it's very variable. Um, some of our orchards, you know, so the, the onus of the outreach as for the most part is on our partner organizations. Um, so some of our partners are really, really great at community outreach. Um, some of them are essentially the community. Um, others um, are in spaces where occasionally I go and I show up for a work day and um, people that I see on the street don't even know there's an orchard. Um, and sometimes some of our orchard spaces are a little bit more enclosed and are, um, you know, specifically for the uh, clients or the benefactors of a particular space. Um, an example of that would be uh, the Ronald McDonald House, which um, has a couple of branches in Philadelphia. Um, I designed and installed an orchard at one of their locations fairly close to my house uh, last fall. And all of the fruit from that space will most likely be used within the Ronald McDonald House itself. Um, so, you know, the neighbors and community around that space won't probably won't really benefit from that at all, but it's mostly a, a commercial kind of industrial space anyway. So um, I, one of the things that I'm actually trying to do in the work that, that I do and, and a lot of urban ag friends of mine are trying to do is kind of change um, the, I guess, change the language or change even the mentality that comes with the idea of improving food access to people in low-income neighborhoods, food deserts, you know, that kind of thing. Um, people don't want to hear that they live in a food desert. Um, in, in Philadelphia, a lot of spaces that I think are considered food deserts, I wouldn't agree with. And I think a lot of people also wouldn't agree. Um, there, there's, I believe that in, it, not always, but I believe in certain scenarios, um, the idea of food deserts has actually been blown out of proportion by people that are seeking funding. Yes. Um, and I don't like the idea of ever using language that is separating, you know, that, that seems like people are needy. Um, and like there's an organization coming in and it's going to save the day. Um, that's not what I'm, you know, what I'm interested in. It's a language that I don't try to use, uh, that I try not to use. Um, but I'm trying to change the paradigm in, you know, in the, the way that people think in terms of like anybody who sees this kind of abundance in their neighborhoods, anybody that sees the kind of work um, that's going on in, you know, a vacant lot or in a previously abandoned space or underutilized space is going to benefit it, benefit from it in one way or the other. Um, hopefully, at a certain point, that benefit will also involve them harvesting food from it and learning how to steward the space and learning how to tend it. Um, 
But if there's one thing that I've learned, um, and I will probably be learning for the rest of my life, um, it's how to be patient. Um, <laughs> you know, these, sure. these, um, you know, working with plants, you know, forces you to be patient, uh, anyway. And it's a kind of patience that I believe is really grounding. Um, but working in communities that are historically oppressed or, um, you know, communities that have, have long histories of, um, mistrusting, um, or large organizations, um, or, you know, mistrusting white people um, is, takes an incredible amount of patience and a lot of very difficult conversations. And I think that that is where the health is coming from at this point. Um, I don't believe that the Philadelphia Orchard Project right now is impacting, you know, it's not filling people's bellies on a regular basis. Um, but to me, that is not that's not the goal right now. The goal is changing people's mindsets, changing, changing consumer, um, consumer thinking, or maybe getting away from, from, you know, capitalist consumerist thinking, um, realizing that we have the ability to take control of our own land and our own neighborhoods and our own bodies. Um, and, um, I think that that it's, it's more maybe a mental health thing at this point than it is a physical health thing, but I think it's all a cascade. You make some really perfect points on that. So looking at Philadelphia and looking at the number of vacant lots that there are or parks that are underutilized, um, in your wildest dreams, uh, if there was a garden and a, an orchard in every single one of those spaces, um, could it be significant in terms of its ability to provide really healthy food to a good percentage of the population? So I learned yesterday, I looked at an updated map on a website uh, in Philadelphia. It's called Grounded in Philly. I believe it's groundedinphilly.org. Um, and it's an interactive map uh, that shows all of the known vacant lots in the city. And as of yesterday, it was there were 40,400 vacant lots that um, have no known use on this map. And um, 831 of uh, 831 lots that have a known use, whether that be for a community space or a garden or an orchard. Um, and that I believe, you know, that that's a map that doesn't include all the parkland. Uh, that's a map that doesn't include um, the privately owned um, nonprofit farms and churches and things like that. Um, so that amount of land, I, I forget at this point how much open space there is in Philadelphia, but it's, it's pretty incredible. Um, I think that we could make a pretty large impact in a lot of ways. Um, if, you know, every single one of those spaces was fully productive and people were tending them and, you know, every, every block had their own little mini orchard and garden, you know, we would make an impact on, in a lot of ways on, you know, probably leafy greens and, and fruits. Um, another thing that I really like talking to people about is making your own medicine. Um, and I think that um, the amount of medicines that could be made um, with, Oh, you know, utilizing more vacant spaces to make medicine, I think um, would be, you know, in a lot of ways, an even more achievable goal. Okay. Um, Do you hear Becky's phone ringing? I mean, I'm yeah. phone ringing. Still in yeah. Becky's phone. <laughs> Guess we should have unplugged that, huh? I can say that again. It's okay. Yeah. Beep. One second. Yeah. Thanks for reading, Robin. It's okay. As an unofficial participant, I'm just gonna ask: Do you do you have any? Uh, you you're you're covering. You're talking about a lot of leafy greens. You know, garden vegetables. I'm sure you could you could do um, and fruits. Do do you guys do any kind of like animal husbandry? Any any part of that? Um, the Philadelphia Orchard Project does not do any animal husbandry. Um, there, it's technically illegal to own chickens in the city of Philadelphia. 
Um, oh, darn. A lot of people who do own them. I personally live in a largely Puerto Rican neighborhood where lots of people have chickens and some people even have pigs um, occasionally and things like that. So, uh, you know, in the places that where people don't care as much or where it's more a part of the, the culture, um, there are animals and, and, you know, people aren't going to do anything about it. Um, but in terms of us doing that um, or any of our spaces, I think maybe only a couple of our orchard partners have chickens at this point. Um, I think you can get them legally if you're like an educational nonprofit or something. Um, but yeah, I think this is a, this is a funny, could become kind of a funny tangent, but I, I do believe that more people need to start thinking in terms of like in urban agriculture, um, making more use of more animals. Um, the city of Philadelphia has tons of parkland and a lot of that parkland has deer on it. Um, urban farms have ridiculous groundhog problems. Um, you know, squirrels are our greatest enemies in orchard spaces. Um, you know, <laughs> people a lot of times talk about, you know, Canadian geese probably being really delicious. And, you know, I, I think that, um, it would be really awesome if there was a little bit more conversation around uh, what my friends and I refer to as urban bushmeat. Um, <laughs> it could could help some, you know, could help some things <laughs> in a lot of ways. <laughs> well, you know, I think I think what you've been talking about is um, one about the number of orchards and food forests and things that you could have. Uh, that and the amount of food that uh, that people who are participating in the project are exposed to, uh, it's it's all about being in relationship with growing food in your neighborhood, and that kind of it's like um, bringing that into reality again as a viable way to to be getting food. Um, but you have to, it takes like you said patience and a long time of being in relationship over the seasons to be able to see that. Yeah, those apples are going to be there next year, or those berries, or whatever it is. And I'm wondering if you've worked with any children who have kind of been participating or watching the project over, say, a five-year period of time, and that they they start to look forward to what's coming next, and that's become part of their lifestyle. Mm. Um, I can think of so I've only been involved in this work like i said since, since really since 2010 um and i can only think of a couple of spaces where i have a lot of where you know i've had contact with the same kids you know year after year after year but there are plenty of our partners that have i'm sure had those kinds of experiences um a funny thing though happens between the ages of you know eight and 10 and 12. And you know, that thing in a lot of cases is just puberty, but in inner city, in my experience in the inner city, um, a lot of times kids fall off uh, for a couple years. Um, maybe they're super excited and they're really involved with their parents or they come by themselves because they really like just being with the gardener. Um, and then, you know, junior high happens and it's not cool anymore. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, I think that probably people in, you know, kids in all sorts of places have experienced that. Um, so there's this like chunk of time when they're really young and then there's this chunk of time when they're in like middle high school um, that I think is more of these like golden opportunity times. Um, and my experience has more been not necessarily seeing someone completely grow up in a space. Um, it's been kind of like, that's hot. fair. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Maybe over time you will. Yeah. Yeah. And like yeah. I said, I yeah. think that there are a lot of spaces that where other, you know, our partners could tell great stories. I'm sure. Of, of sure. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, I don't know. It sounds, I, I think I want to take a trip to Philadelphia now to see some of these. <laughs> live and in person yeah um, a lot of them are pretty great yeah 
So, uh, Bill, do you have any other pictures or anything you wanted to make comment on? I thought other than that, I think we could probably wrap it up. Yeah, I think so, too. I, I guess um, I appreciate you um, uh, talking a little bit about the, uh, the human side of these projects, Robin, because we all know that, um, especially in, in permaculture, we have all these ideas of all these things we can do, but always the Achilles heels is the, the people piece of it, the interface uh, between the individuals involved and the individuals who want to create something there. Um, could you share anything about a personal experience that you might have had in the, in the last several years that, that really touched you or that really connected you to this work and made you realize how important it is? Is there any personal experience you'd be willing to share? Um, well, this is kind of more of a, of like an overarching thing that I, that I've been really reflecting on this year, um, is that I, I think that I came into Philadelphia and started getting obsessed with growing food and learning about plants at a really pretty pivotal time in this urban agriculture movement. And as a result, um, although it hasn't been that many years, I have a ton, I have an extremely large network. Um, and I have been able to kind of stand back and, and reflect a lot this year on all of the people in the city that I have helped to uh, maybe connect with a job or an internship or um, maybe uh, they're going to school for horticulture now or, um, you know, something like that. Um, mm -hmm. I give job recommendations all the time. I write letters of reference all the time. I um, refer people for training programs all the time. And I am doing a lot more teaching as time goes on, designing a lot of my own classes to just get people to, you know, do a bunch of information dumping on anybody who's interested. <laughs> um, and that has resulted in all sorts of really incredible things, you know, knowing people pretty much everywhere I go and realizing, you know, Oh, I haven't seen that person in a while. That's because they decided to leave the city and work on a farm for a season or, you know, that kind of thing. Um, mm -hmm. And that feels really great um, because it's given me more of a, a perspective and an understanding that like the weight of all of these things is not just on my shoulders and that I'm, very consciously doing a lot of work to make sure that there are tons of people that are now doing the work and that the work will continue happening even if I decide that I need to do something else with my life. Um, that feels really, really good. And I think that's a huge amount of what it's about. Yeah, brilliant. I noticed that you have uh, some fundraising uh, events kind of coming up, and uh, I was wondering if um, you try to feature a lot of the, or try to time those when you could be using fruit from the orchards or berries. Um. Yeah, we try to feature the fruits uh, in various ways as much as we can. Um, mm -hmm. As far as uh, things that we're doing that are coming up, um, the only thing... I might be wrong, uh, but the only thing that I can think of that is a, a, a somewhat of a fundraiser is mostly an awareness raiser um, with, uh, around the, the Juneberry or the Serviceberry or Amelanc year, um, which is happening starting like any minute. I ate my first ripe Juneberry off my the tree <laughs> the road, um, today. Oh, good. Uh, and um, we, so every year we do a Juneberry Joy campaign where we have all right. all this various places all over the city. Um, and some of those June berries go to other to small businesses, uh, culinary businesses in the city where they make use of them and feature pop and, you know, tell people what June berries are. And hopefully over time, um, you know, everybody in the city will realize that all of these really pretty berries, the first week of June on the trees planted all over the place are actually edible. Yeah. Um, that's a big part of the goal. Um, <laughs> So Fantastic. that will yeah. be, you know, it's, it's in a small way, that's a fundraiser, but it's mostly a way of just getting people really excited about June berries and the beginning of the harvest season. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. And we also have a strawberry festival uh, coming up. That'll be on June 10th. And that's, that will be the ninth annual strawberry festival. Ninth, uh, strawberry. I think, I think maybe that's the one I saw, but yeah, anyway, yeah. well, 
anyway, so good luck with all of these programs, and you know, may they continue to be fruitful. Mm-hmm. Yeah, thank you for sharing with us today. Yeah, absolutely. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. It was great talking. Pleasure with you. talking with you, Robin. Yeah. Okay, and that's the Philadelphia Orchard Project. <laughs> Thanks so much.